latest 1902 Victoria Day photo of Bay Street, or Bear Street as it was first called, nothing much of its present prestige and power can be seen. Before the beginning of this century, Bay Street was only a back lane to Young Street, running from Queen Street in the north to the harbor on the south, not worthy of much prestige. This video is a nostalgic reflection of the streetcars that brought citizens from the northwest suburbs to the heart of the city. So sit back and see how we used to be. The two men who have done a great service to the preservation of street rail history in Toronto are John Mills and Jack Knowles. 
John Mills, a founding father of the Rockwood Trolley Museum, has published a history of Hamilton's electric lines as well as a history of Toronto's radio railways. Jack Knowles, also a founding father of the Rockwood Trolley Museum, has contributed many historical photos to other publications, as well as publishing a history of the Sudbury Coppercliff Suburban Electric Railway Company. Let's sit back now with John and Jack and take a trip up Bay Street to the end of the line. 42 is the, boat right, the right date for this section, wouldn't you say? Front Street coming up under, from under the railway. You notice on the City Hall Tower in the background, they had a sort of a thermometer thing, which is how they used to keep track of the uh, progress of the victory bond drives all during the war. Oh, I see they were using large wits on the Bathurst line there. One just went by. Well, uh, the couplers weren't maintained because the cars were never used for pulling trailers after they left the Dundas assignment uh, because of the steep grade on Avenue Road. The, uh, the Avenue Road Hill was considered just too steep for trailer operation. Well, they did haul, uh, they ran uh, uh, young trains up there all right in emergencies. It could be done, but I guess they didn't want to do it as a regular thing. There were only 50 of the, of the brills. They were quite, uh, the floor plan was much the same, but structurally they were quite different from the, uh, all the other cars that were built the Canadian car and foundry design. These, uh, what we call the brills, were, were actually designed by the G.C. Kuhlman Company in Cleveland, which was a brill subsidiary. And uh, they built them for uh, several cities in the U.S. Cleveland had a bunch of them, Akron had them, uh, Detroit had them slightly modified, and they were built for other people too. But they were the only ones in this country, and they were built by the Preston Car and Coach Company, which had been taken over by brill to build them because in 1921 the TDC would not take uh, uh, tenders for any of their new equipment uh, from anything other than Canadian builders. So to make themselves eligible, the build people took over Preston. Uh, but the, the cars they built there, the 50 uh, width, large widths, were uh, to uh, Kuhlman design and they were not as well built as the, uh, the Canadian car uh, rails. The, the bodies were quite a bit looser. They would sway from side to side where the width wouldn't. But uh, they were much smoother running and they had more comfortable seats in. They had brill seats and brill trucks and they were, uh, they were the smoothest cars in town before the PCCs came. They were quite a bit smoother than any of the widths. Oh, there were two men. They were never converted. <coughs> they, uh, at the end when the subway was getting, when they were getting ready to open the subway, they drew up plans to re, uh, rebuild all the, uh, the can car wits for one man. But they never considered doing that for the bills because by that time the bodies were in such bad shape that they weren't worth uh, put, spending the money on. They were the only wits that were, they, they, they started uh, taking out of service because of body deterioration. All the others were, were the result of accidents and whatnot. But, uh, you could sit and you could see uh, the, the wall swaying with relation to the floor on, the, on these things, which you couldn't on. Were these cars that had uh heaters in them, or they have uh, stoves? Oh, they all had stoves. The TTC didn't use electric heaters because they would uh, put up the peak uh, hydro load requirements too high. It was much cheaper to use uh, stoves that didn't add to the power bill.
Oh, they ran for a number of years on Dundas Street, and in the early 30s they got moved well, on we're to Bay. Oh, we're back in the, in the early 30s, wasn't it? Yes, I think uh, there was a time when Danforth, had, Danforth Carhouse had some of them. Yeah. The reason they always stayed together was that they, they, uh, they were unlike anything else, and they had, all, they had to have a completely different set of spare parts for them. So they just wanted to have the spare parts for bills at one car house. So Sinclair was the one that was chosen. Had, they had General Electric motors on a very good and reliable motor, which the shop had very little trouble with. The other uh, large wits by Canadian Car and Foundry had either Westinghouse or uh, Dick Kerr motors in them. Yeah. But you can see from these pictures how smoothly the, the brills rose. That's not an exaggeration. They really they were pullmans in one way. So if they had good trucks and good motors, the problem was with the bodies, really. As well built, there was a lot more wood in them. The front platforms was practically all wood with with. Uh, simply some uh, steel screwed over it to look good. Whereas with the can car wits, the structure of the front vestibule was completely steel. Brill did a little out of that. I've never, I never was too impressed with Brill construction techniques. Other people did it better than Brill, although they're the most famous builder. Originally, when the line on Avenue Road was first built, this was the end of the line here at DuPont Street. And then around the turn of the century, they put a Y in there with a long, long tail track that crossed the railway at, on the level and went up to Cottingham Street, which is about a uh, fifth of a mile. And they backed that whole distance up there. And then uh, they uh, managed to kill a pedestrian during the backing movement and uh, got into a lot of legal trouble over it. So they cut off the extension and, and uh, wide the cars at uh, DuPont again, then they get in trouble with the city because they didn't have the, the service over the 800 feet of track up to Cottingham Street, and there was quite a squabble over it. It went on for a long time. This is uh, Avenue Road in St. Clair. This was uh, one of the biggest transfer points in the city. This was the end of the Toronto Railway line, which finally got up here in 1906, and then in 1912, the Civic Railways built their line on St. Clair, and this became a very heavy transfer point right here. There are pictures of long, long lines of cars waiting to get, of people waiting to get on the, uh, the double enders on the Civic. West of here, this section was originally uh, on a center reservation with center poles and bracket arms. There's the switchman uh, setting the switch. That track leads down to the uh, Witchwood car house. And that was transformed by the TTC. Originally, it was a very small three-track structure uh, built by the uh, Civic Railways on what the local residents thought was a park. And there was a big fight over putting it there in the first place. And then when the TTC took it over, they uh, expanded the capacity to about five times what it had been before. I think it was expanded from 25 cars to 125 or something, so they just about transformed that, uh, that uh, car house. Here we are at uh, Oakwood Avenue. This is the Oakwood and Rogers lines, which were built not by the TDC, but by the Township of York, and they were operated uh, by the TDC on behalf of the township. This is before the metro area came in. Uh, as uh, the Township of York Railways, which was quite a little operation, they had uh, their own fare structure and they had their own transfers actually. So it was like a, a separate little system operated by the TTC for the township. I think it was the last place you could get 11 tickets for 50 cents. We're coming along uh, 
sinclair avenue here those rather unique safety zones were put in there when the center reservation was taken out in the thirty's i was that there was a very stupid thing to do this is lands down loop but they later changed to earl's court loop this is the end of the line for the bay cars and they had to uh, sort out this entire PCCs from the Bay Brills here, and uh, you can't see them. The Lansdowne cars also used the same loop just out of the picture to the right, so it was quite a busy spot. Yeah, these are taken uh, when I should have been uh, going to university classes in the early 50s. This is at St. Clair and Lansdowne. Yeah, well, they had announced that the what the fruit what the routings were going to be after the uh, the uh, young subway was opening, and the Bay Line was simply going to disappear altogether. So I, I just wanted to get some record shots of the uh, the cars that were about to disappear operating on a route that was about to disappear. This was just a series of record shots. Of course, while the young subway was under construction and the young car line was forced off onto all kinds of diversions. Uh, the bay really had some of its heaviest years of riding in the early 50s, and it was mostly traffic that uh, normally would have been on the young car line if it hadn't been on diversion. The uh, city was very upset with the TTC keeping the streetcars on Avenue Road because they thought it got in the way of the traffic uh, coming downtown, and they put a lot of pressure on them to get the car tracks off there. That was one of the main reasons why they, they went for the, uh, the young subway, just to get the tracks off Avenue Road. I don't think it helped much when they did. This is, this is coming down uh, Avenue Road. The track, there was a really rough track on Avenue Road Hill here. If you watch the picture, you can see him swaying. Not here, but there was a lousy joint just at the bottom of the hill. But where those cars are, I think it's this scene. He practically takes off. Were they restricted to a certain speed? Well, not officially, but the motormen all knew where you had to slow down. You can see him rocking from there, guy. Yeah. It was a matter of, of uh, experience. They let a lot of the track go on, on Avenue Road and on uh, Young Street towards the end. They just weren't bothering to fix it. And, Young Street, to be blood about it, was a mess as far as the track went. This was just uh, a week or two before the, uh, the line quit. What happened to these cars? Well, they were all junked. They weren't, they weren't worth keeping. There was a story about Rochester there, Jack. Yes, Rochester uh, looked at buying them to replace some of their Cincinnati interurban cars that they were using in the subway. But, and they actually took them out on a demonstration ride with them, I believe, but the sale was never completed. The uh, TDC saved a number of motors and trucks from them to use under uh, work cars for the subway, RT1 to RT4 and RT6. So that they, uh, this bears out the story, of course, that the trucks and motors were good, even though the bodies weren't. All the trucks end up, or uh, I think all those trucks are up Rockway, or will be. They must be. Yeah. I think so. uh, 20, uh, 2666, I think, was the last brill to be painted. So we rechartered the thing and ran it all over the place. This is down, uh, down near the exhibition. Backing in, backing in to pose for still photos at the lighthouse. This is a long way from home for the brills. This is on Lakeshore Road uh, at Mimico. The, uh, I was resting the camera on the windowsill, and this is another indication of how smoothly those brills ran, even over the special work on the Y here. You'll see there's hardly any vibration in the streetcar at all. Never could understand why they built that Y. They never used it. Here we are at Long Branch. We're taking the, uh, <coughs> the siding to keep out of the way of the regular, the regular cars pass us here. Was this a UCRS chair? Uh, I presume so. We used to operate all the trips in the name of the UCRS, though. It was uh, usually whoever happened to be 
uh, ambitious enough to organize it. Just to the left there is the uh, station where you got the radio which ran out to Port Credit. There was a track connection uh, in the background there. Uh, this is Humber Loop as it was in 1952. It's all disappeared under the expressway construction since then. The, uh, um, we're backing here into the loop to get out of the way of the regular cars, which we always had to do on these trips. Made life interesting when you were riding on the trips. Though. This is, my goodness, we do get around. This is Birchmount, the other end of town. Well, you can always tell pictures taken to Birchmount Loop because it was about the only one where you could get down below rail level and look up at the cars coming around. That car just passing is 4549, which was the last uh, T, uh, PCC car built to TTC order in 1951. It was the last of the 550 uh, PCC cars we had. After that, there were 195 uh, second-hand ones from very various American cities. And we made the largest fleet of PCC cars in the world. 770-something. The last few years, they, they were mixing uh, one-man PCCs in with the uh, with the Brills, and towards the end, the uh, PCCs were carrying all the base service, and the two-man cars just came out in, <coughs> in rush hours, largely to make work for uh, older uh, conductors at Sinclair and so on, who weren't qualified as motormen and wouldn't have anything to do. But uh, this sequence here is taken out the back window of a PCC car and in regular normal service. It was inspired by a thing the BBC did of, uh, what was it, 10 minutes to Brighton or some such thing uh, out the front window of a Southern Electric train. So uh, I did the same thing out the back window of a PCC car again because the, the line was about to quit. It was quitting, I think, the, the weekend following. So that uh, this is uh, a rather fast trip on the uh, Bay Line uh, right at the end of its existence. That one frame per second? Yeah, one frame a second, roughly. Just uh, click, 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 click out the back window. It's one, or speed it up about uh, 12 times.
Well, that was the quick way down Bay Street in 1963. The streetcar track, last used in 1963, is still visible today. The classic Bay shuttle bus ferries people from Queens Key to Front Street. This old track will be ripped up and a new streetcar will run under Bay Street as part of the Harborfront light rail transit line from Union Station to Spadina. After the streetcars were removed from Bay Street in 1963, diesel buses replaced them. Pollution and noise became such a problem in the 70s that trolley buses were put into service on the route. It is possible that this ALRV on display outside City Hall will someday run up Bay Street and Bay Street will once again have its streetcars. Yorkville, 1865, the first streetcar line in Canada. It ran from St. Lawrence Hall to the Yorkville Town Hall. In the following scenes, we see how the Young Street line was extended all the way to Richmond Hill and beyond to Lake Simcoe. started out in, in the uh, late 80s as a horse car line running. It ran from the, the CPR crossing at, uh, north of uh, Rosedale there, and it ran up to Eglinton, just two miles. And it, they kept on extending it and extending it bit by bit. It got to Richmond Hill in 1896 and it got all the way up to Lake Simcoe in 1907. But it just grew as the population extended. 
and it uh, had a lot to do with, uh, with moving the population in there to start with. What uh, was electrified before the first electrifications on the Toronto Railway Company, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was the first electrification around here, 1889. I think I had to bring uh, experts in from the Thompson-Houston Company in Boston because they didn't figure there was anybody in this country that could, uh, could handle it. But uh, it, was the, it was the first. Uh, it was electrified two years before the uh, horse cart lines were in this, inside the city. It was one of the very earliest in Canada. And then uh, they uh, started lopping off bits and pieces off the south end of it as the city cars extended. So it was extended at the north, and then it was chopped off bit by bit at the south. So when the line finally ended, there wasn't any, it didn't own any of the track that it had originally owned in 1887, or whatever it was, because they, they had been, uh, that had become part of the Young Street car line. The uh, Hogs Hollow Hill was much steeper than it is today, and it was one of the uh, favorite things for the kids who would come down to the Fairlawn Theater to the south of the city limits here. They'd get on the car after the matinee was over, and it would all congregate behind the motor man, and it all shout and yell, and when you started down the hill after you came out of the station, They'd yell, come on, mister, make it go faster, make it go faster. Well, it wasn't hard to do that because uh, the hill in those days was very, very steep. A great deal of work was put into the uh, leveling out of this hill before they uh, started some of the building that has been going on. The high-rise apartments are down the bottom of the, near the York Mills Road. But it was a very, a very interesting place. And of course, coming north, it was a very, very slow climb. You couldn't make the car go any faster coming north. It, it just had its own climbing speed, and that was all. But it was a very interesting part of the line. There was located, before you turned into the um, station, the only regulation railroad whistle sign left on the whole line. And it stood on a pole on the um, west side of the street just before you turned into the, if you're coming north just before you turned into the station and of course coming south it was intended in those days in the early days that you would uh, give a, a regulation railroad whistle sign for that street but it, it, it was very 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 interesting and very very much different than what this today very much it, there are very few people left around this part now, that, and certainly art writers, oh, uh, past art writers on the line. Uh, I don't know only but myself and uh, probably Ross Henderson, who was the dispatcher, that are really left now. The rest are all passed on. But it was a very interesting line and lots of fun, very folksy. Nearly everybody knew everybody. And, and on the night car, you knew, well, you knew practically every living soul. 
what you got going at Miss Oliver. Oh, nice, real, real family affair. Well, I really moved into this area here about 40 years ago, 40, 40, 45 years ago. And uh, it wasn't until 1942 that I, I joined the commission. But I've always, I always worked in Eglinton Division here. All, all my work has been done in the North End. And uh, I worked on Young Street, of course, for, for a number of years. And then uh, I decided that uh, North Young Railways was a, a good thing. So I worked with extra split there. It was easy at that time because they couldn't get extra men to go up there. Nobody really wanted to work up there. The men who got crews, yes, they could. They were all right. But an extra man, he didn't want to work in the city today and, and tomorrow find himself posted on the North Young Railway. And, and uh, so I did that for a long while. And then, uh, of course, the line came off and went to buses, so I stayed with the buses. When, when, at that time, when the bus went, it was the second time because they, they, the cars had been on before and they come off and the buses had gone on. And then they, they put the, uh, the cars back on again. Oh, I worked, I worked the, uh, the extra split there. Then I got, uh, nobody wanted the night car. I took the night car for two or three years. Well, that was a, well, that was a, a, a little thing because uh, after well, 10 o'clock at night, it was pretty, pretty well, maybe t around 10 o'clock, you get about your last heavy load up from that. that it was after midnight, you were, you were done. You, you get, might get the odd strike or going up that way, but in those days, they, they were in the country. They didn't travel down the city for, for late fun, and uh, it was, it was a, an easy thing. The odd time you might get a woman on, and uh, you'd, fi you'd find out where she lived, and uh, usually always those women uh, would be the ones who lived on Young Street, so you could stop right in front of their door, and you'd wa watch them up the well, driveway or... Uh, if the house was too far back, you just wait until she got up the driveway and then open the door and got in the house and then she switch on the outside light to let you know everything was all right and off you go again. first movie I ever took, I think I was about 16 at the time, and uh, my father was quite convinced that I was going to, to do something disastrous with the camera, throw it out a streetcar window, or drop it on the pavement or some such thing. But uh, he finally let me take it, but made sure that there was practically no film left in it. So that's how come there are only four scenes. But uh, <coughs> uh, the, I knew the line was going to go, because it was obviously an anachronism, so as I, I had the chance to take the pictures, so I did. They're, they're not very good, but they're the only ones, as far as I know, that are. Well, car 416 was one of eight radio cars used originally on the Lakeshore line from Sunnyside to Port Credit when it was a single-track line with frequent passing sightings. It later, after short use in city service, went up and ran on the North Young Railway which ran from the city limits at Young Boulevard to Richmond Hill, about a 10-mile line, partly on the side of the road right-of-way, but through Willowdale and Newtonbrook, it was on a median strip in the middle of the road. And this was another line that was single track, but had fairly frequent passing sightings, and some of them were long enough to accommodate uh, several cars when charters were being operated. The cars were built in the mid-1920s for the Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario, 
which at the time was running the Toronto area radials, and they were part of a larger group. The remainder of the group went to Windsor as city cars. When the North Young Railways ceased operating, the cars were sold for scrap, and the body of 416 was sold for use as a dwelling in Hillsburg, and that's how it came to survive. Most of the windows were blocked up with heavy plyboard with insulation put behind them, and a family was raised in the, the um, car, but eventually the museum, after watching the, the car for a number of years, learned that the property was for sale and that the owner would be happy to sell the car separately. So in early 1973, the car was moved by Charles Matthews House Movers of Langstaff from Hillsburg down to the museum, and it's been slowly restored using equipment obtained from other cars to make an operating car out of it. Well, these pictures, a series of pictures taken of the, uh, the North Young car at the Rockwood Railway Museum, and Jack and I are both uh, founding members of that. It was started in, in 1953, uh, largely because we got tired of waiting for what were, who were then the rail fan leaders in Toronto to do something. The TTC had announced that it was going to get rid of, uh, for, of 1326, and uh, all that the uh, uh, establishment, rail fan establishment did was wring their hands and say how terrible somebody ought to do something. So Jack and I and four or five of our friends just decided that if the, our elders and betters weren't going to do it, we would. So uh, we started the thing in the summer of 1954, and it's <coughs> been growing and growing ever since. We never dreamed that the thing would be as big as it did. But uh, one of the very, the cars that we had our eye on longest was the body of 416 up at Hillsburg. And we would go back there every year or two and have a look at it and make sure that the old lady who lived in it hadn't uh, messed it up too much. And uh, finally, I guess she died and they were selling the property, so we bought the body. And, uh, brought it back to Rockwood uh, 20 years after the museum was formed, and then it sat around for quite a while before we got around to working on it. It's the first, uh, what is known in the museum business as chicken coop restoration. In other words, putting a car back in service from a, from a totally dead body, because it was nothing but a, uh, a hollow shell that the lady had converted into living quarters. And they built a little, uh, a little lean-to at one of the doors where she had her shower and, her, and so on. And uh, otherwise, it was just she lived in the, in the streetcar. So these pictures are taken on the first day. We'd been working on it for, for several years and uh, uh, made the last connections in the control gear. And they decided to see if it would work, and it worked. And it worked so well that they took it out and ran it up and down quite a bit that day, which we hadn't intended to do. But uh, you can tell the thing is not finished. One of the doors is being held together with bits of rope, and there's no trolley hook on this end of the car, and there's only half the number of seats in it and so on. But uh, uh, it's quite a feeling when the thing, the, the car that you've been working on for, for, what, 13 years, the day it finally picks up its heels and operates under its own power. In other words, it's a streetcar again. For the, for the first time in, how long had that been? It would be, be 30 years, more than 30 years. You know, you're, 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 you're putting, you're, you're, uh, in a sense, you're creating life where there was no life before. Here we go. Ready? No. Okay. Okay.
Well, in this film, we've seen uh, a lot of old technology, but the thing to be kept in mind is that the technology is also new because uh, there's a we've seen a lot of old streetcars and whatnot, but under the skin, uh, they're not very different from the latest light rail vehicles and the latest uh, subway trains and so forth. Uh, but they're, the, they're how the transit business grew up. They're the sort of stages in, in growing up. And, uh, the advantage of the railway museum is that you can see uh, these old things operating as closely as possible to the way they were designed to be operated, not as uh, something old and broken down, but something new and freshly designed. And uh, uh, if you want to see uh, how, um, how it all began, uh, there's no better place than to go out and, and actually ride on it, look at it, listen to it, and see it run out at the railway museum. It's, it, there's like there's, there's no other place that you can do that. In addition to the many, the, the great variety of streetcars at the Rocket Museum, you can also ride the WITS in Toronto. The TTC has two of them, uh, which they run on charters and tours in downtown. Uh, the one they normally use, 2424, actually belongs to the Rockwood Museum, and we lease it back to the TTC. But uh, uh, so that you can uh, sample uh, Toronto cars from the 20s running and doing exactly what they were intended to do and in very good condition uh, in addition. So that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's possible to live the past even in Toronto as well as at the museum. Each year, Rockwood's volunteers continue to restore and run streetcars. The Halton County Radio Railway is located 15 kilometers north of Highway 401 at exit 312 on the Guelph Line and is open from mid-May to the end of October. During the months of June, July, and August, the Trolley Museum is open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So spend an enjoyable day, bring the whole family to the Rockwood Trolley Museum.